Now, if you're able, please stand for the reading of Scripture. Our passage today is Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. I'm going to call up Michael Tooley, who's going to be preaching today, and we'll pray together. Let's pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, it's so good to be here in your building today. It's so good to worship together. And Lord, I just pray right now for Michael as he brings us the word that you have given him. I pray for boldness and courage. Lord, I pray that you would just speak through him and make much of yourself this morning. For all of us in the building, Lord, I just pray that we would push away distractions and that our hearts and minds would be open to hear from you. Lord, we thank you so much for this church and for the way you care for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love hearing that welcome every every time because it, it's, it's never not applicable, right, for any of us. Uh, well, long ago, in a, in a distant land called Colorado, uh, I was living in Denver. I, I had just gotten married about two years ago, and me and my wife had this massive 700-square-foot apartment. Um, I don't remember how much it cost, but, you know, it was a lot because it was Denver. We were uh, a part of a local church where I played bass, uh, not by choice. Um, we were also, we had some friends that were involved in a church plant that was meeting on Monday nights, kind of like a, you know, Bible study time. So we were going to that too. I was fresh out of Bible college. I I didn't really have a good idea of what the church is, (laughs) right? Um, I thought I knew a lot being, being young that that I was. Uh, so being fresh out of Bible college, part of this other church. And then in the midst of this, my friend was uh, trying to get me to move to Missouri from Colorado. I don't know what he was thinking. Um, so we start actually making plans. So, so we're, we're going to this church on Sunday. We're meeting with this other church plan on Monday nights. And then we're going to move to Missouri and go be a part of that church. And so we start making plans. Uh, it was not a fun time uh, for both of us. Very stressful. Newlyweds going to up, uproot our lives and, and go to Missouri. So we call one of the pastors in Missouri, and I'm on the phone with this guy, Rob, for two hours, life-changing conversation. And he said, it sounds like you can't commit to a church. And I was like, what what do you mean? (laughs) Because at the time, I was committed to like three churches. So uh, (laughs) through that conversation, God began to work in my heart, and we decided to stay in Denver, um, but <laughs> again, just young Michael, I was like, all right, we're going to leave this church where I'm playing bass and we're going to join this church plant because, you know, I just, you know, I feel like they're missing out on my worship leading skills. <laughs> and so I met with the pastor of this church plant and I said, hey, like, we're going to stay in Denver and we're going to come join you guys because I think I could really help there. I, I think I could really be a good help, and I was like, my church doesn't really need me, like, they have a lot of musicians, I'm just playing bass there, and the most painful, loving words came out of his mouth, he said, your job is to wash the feet of the people with the towel Jesus hands you, and right now, that's the bass, and then he said, I don't want a guy to come to my church who doesn't love to play the bass for Jesus. 
He's like, your church might seem like a well-oiled machine, but the need in any church is an open hand to serve people. That was the beginning for me of having a love for the church, of understanding what the church actually is, that it's a people, that it's a people that God has made for himself. It changed everything for me. And so as we've been going through this series, it's just been life-giving. And I, I, I'm, I, just a heads up, I'm tired and I'm already a big emotions guy. I'm big feelings. And when, when I'm tired, it's elevated. So yeah, uh, it's going to be fun today. But I, to, to give a quick recap, because, because I love the church, and that means I love you guys. When we came here to North Carolina, it started out, we're already getting going, this is going to be great. It started out as strangers. It started out as, well, what we did at my sending church was this. What we did at my sending church is this. And then it transformed over time to, man, I love those people. Man, I love the, the Bustles, the Agrelias's. Man, I love the Baileys. Like, it goes from being just this amalgamous entity of go to church to specific people that God has put in our lives. And so to give a recap, I'll start my timer now. Those minutes don't count. Uh, <laughs> we've gone through this. We, uh, Brian Robinson of Steadfast Church in Asheville gave us this sermon series. So the artwork, they gave it to us. They gave us the outlines. Um, and then we did the study of the passages on our own. But he gave us this alliteration. Uh, so we went through the purpose, the power, the practice, the presence, persistence, and today we're on the promise. I get to close off the sermon series. Billy was a little sad about that, but that's what happens when you're out of town. Um, the purpose of the church we learned in week one was to glorify God. We glorify God. That's, that's the whole thing. Um, and we do that by making disciples. We do that by having fellowship with one another. The power of the church is the love of Christ. So if there is any power existent, it's only because of the love of Jesus, both given towards us and then given outwards to the world around us. The practice of the church is to be a people who love one another. The way that people will recognize that we are a church that actually belongs to God is by how our love for one another is demonstrated. The presence of the church is a faithful, peaceful, fruitful one. So if we're not bearing fruit, we're not going to last. If we're not faithful, we're not going to last. And if we're not a calm presence in an anxious world, what's the point? The persistence of the church is built on our shared confidence in Christ. And so why do we persevere? Because Jesus, because he persevered. So here we are in our passage today, and the the text that we read through, the, the main point of what's going on there is that there's this exchange happened between Jesus and his disciples, and he says the foundation of the church, the, the starting point for all of it is the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is who he says he was, is. And so our big idea today is the promise of the church is that it will not fail because Jesus made it. So again, I, I'm going to thank Brian Robinson a lot for this outline because it really saved a lot of time. Outline is like the hardest thing for me. So um, we have a great question, a great answer, and a great promise. If you are a note taker, those are your three points. We'll start with the great question in verses 13 through 15. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to him, but who do you, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? So right away, the context of our passage, what's kind of been going on is helpful as we, as we make some initial observations. Just before this exchange, Matthew records Jesus ministering in Galilee. He's, he's healing many. He's performing miracles left and right. He, he feeds a lot of people, over 4,000 people. And then the religious leaders, they corner him and they say, give us a sign. Um, yeah, it's a little confusing. So here we are now away from the hustle and bustle in pagan territory of Caesarea Philippi. 
And it may seem odd for Jesus to bring his disciples here, but it actually kind of makes sense that they would go to a place where he wouldn't be quickly recognized so that he could have time alone with the 12. And this helps us understand why Jesus would ask this question. You know, he's living in the midst of people. He's performing miracles left and right, but it just doesn't seem to be clicking with anyone. There's some observations we can make on this. First, Jesus cares about our context. He cares about the culture, and so should we. We're not called to be an insular group that has Bible studies that face inward, that has church that faces inward. Eventually, the seats have to turn around and we're sent out. We should know about our culture. We should know about Burke County. We should know what they believe. And Jesus knew that there was a lot of confusion about who he was during that time. And the same is true today. There's so much confusion. And and here's the reality of our context here in the South. There are many who have been brought up in sort of a, a Christianized culture. There's polite folks. There's Southern branded hospitality. And it has some marks of Christianity. You could grow up in it and fit in a church and never meet Jesus. When you dig deep, you might not find Jesus in a lot of it. So this this Christianized culture, many are just as confused as Jesus about Jesus as the people they would deem unreachable. Perhaps some of you are confused about who Jesus is. You spent years in the church playing the game, saying the right sorts of things, and yet at night when you're alone with your thoughts and you think about the hope that you heard about, you think about the peace that surpasses all understanding, it's it's foreign to you. Maybe you've heard about Jesus. Maybe you know about Jesus, but you don't know him. And that's the second observation we make from these just these few verses. It matters what we believe. It matters who we say Jesus is. In verse 15, he changes the question. He, he says, well, who do they say that I am, but who do you say that I am? It matters who we think Jesus is, and it matters who we say he is. It matters who we say he is with our words, who, he, who we say he is with our actions. So what is our answer? Well, for starters, our answer should line up at least with what Jesus said about who he is. So I'm going to just go through a few of them for the sake of time. Uh, First, he is God the Son. Jesus is God, fully man, fully God. Mark 14, 61 and 62 says, but he remained silent with no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And if you don't fully understand that, you can guarantee the, the people there that he answered understood that that was a claim. John chapter 10, he says, if I'm not doing the works of my father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I'm in the father. So he is God, the son. You you cannot have God, the father without Jesus. And you cannot have Jesus, the son without God, the father. He says in John 10 30, just a few verses before this, I and the father are one. So Jesus was not a standalone character in the Bible that you can admire as a role model or an example and call yourself a Christian. He's either God or a liar. You cannot love Jesus and not love God the Father. Next, he is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6 and 7, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. For now on, you do know him and you have seen him. So in a post-truth world, right, Jesus stands in defiance as the only way to the father. If you want a relationship with God, there is no other path than Jesus Christ. If you want someone to know God, you point them to Jesus. The world says, you can't know truth. And we say, yes, you can. His name is Jesus Christ. If I handed you a $100 bill, it'd probably make you pretty happy. You can get a whole gallon of gas with that. (laughs) You might feel really loved by me if I gave you a $100 bill. You go about your week imagining how you're going to spend your $100. Now imagine you get to the store and you to pay for your item, your gallon of gas, 
And as you go to hand the bill, you look down and you see George Washington's face on it. Everything else about the bill looks legitimate. It even has the weird hologram stripe on it, the second face on it when you hold it up to the light. How did you not notice the wrong face on it, though? It's so close to the real thing, and yet it is utterly worthless. It might seem loving to give a softened version of Jesus, a Jesus who doesn't say, deny yourself, a Jesus who doesn't say, come and die that you may live, a comfortable Jesus that doesn't sanctify, it might seem loving to give that as an option, but friends, it's a false gospel and therefore is the most unloving thing you can do. Don't let anyone miss out on the real thing by giving them something that may be close, but it misses the mark. Christ alone is the door to salvation. And lastly, from these little verses and and what we're going to see today, he's the builder of the church. Our verse today, Matthew 16, 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church is his. In fact, in Mark chapter 2, Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom, and we see in the New Testament the church as his bride. So you cannot claim to love Jesus, but hate his bride, the church. You come to me, you tell me how great I am, you want to, let's, let's do partner in ministry, let's, let's do life together, let's be best friends, let's hang out. But then you tell me, you can't stand my wife. I like you, Michael, but your wife, I just don't know. Dude, we're done, though. We're not hanging out. How much more the king of the ages who laid down his life for his bride, the church. Jesus loves his church, and so should we if we're to follow him. We're going to spend a lot of time today unpacking the significance of that. It's the promise of the church. It's the name of this final sermon in this series. It's going to be awesome. So who do we say, in all the ways that we could say it, who do we say Jesus is? Let's look at how Peter answered the question. Verse 16. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And Peter has got to be one of my favorites. He, he is the bold mistake maker of Scripture. Only this time, as he opens his mouth, the most profound, eternal truth of the ages comes out. He's so convinced that this teacher that he's been doing life with is from God. John Calvin points out that Peter attributes living God, lest there be any confusion. Jesus Jesus is from the God, not the dead idols of the time, not the statues that were formed in the city square. And we know from the rest of the gospel accounts that, that Peter likely doesn't fully understand what he's declaring. We see his mouth seem to jump in front of his brain quite a bit, actually. But nonetheless, he recognizes that Jesus is no ordinary man. He's come from above. That's what the name of Christ means. It means anointed one, Messiah. Peter knows Jesus is the Savior, even if he doesn't fully understand what that entails. So how does he know? Is he, of all the disciples, how did Peter figure this out? Is he just smarter than the other disciples? Probably not. But it's, it's like he solved it. He steps out in front of everybody. You know, like when you're at a restaurant and your mouth is full and the server says, um, is everybody okay? And you actually need some more water, but somebody else at the table answers for you. We're fine. Peter jumps in front of everybody and says, this is who you are, Jesus. He looked at the evidence and came to a conclusion, but that, that can't be the case either because there was so much evidence before this, right? They were, what about when they were on the boat and, the, and the, the waves were crashing around them, and Jesus said, stop, and it just stopped. Why now? Why in this moment? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 17, God revealed it to him. You see, none of us who, who believe that Jesus is the Christ, none of us who believe have any stake in the game. We have no claim of mental assent, no right to stand above anyone else and say, I figured it out. 
If you believe in Jesus, it's because you've been rescued out of darkness by the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. You may think that apart from God saving you, that you just examine the evidence, you discerned right from wrong, and you made a decision to follow Jesus because it's the right thing to do and you're a moral person. But that's not what the Scriptures say. Scripture says you were dead in your trespasses and God made you alive. You were by nature a child of wrath. You were far off and you've been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Jesus said in John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him on the last day. So, should we even share the gospel then? Should we even evangelize? And I think to ask that question... I just, I just don't think when we've been transformed by Jesus that we think that way. You see, we evangelize for a lot of reasons, like Jesus commanded us to. That's one of the last commands he gave us. But what a miracle and a scandal all wrapped up in that God would choose us to be his re- instruments of redemption. God is at work in the lives of people all over, and he will use us in their lives. And ultimately, we tell others about Jesus because we love him. Every follower of Jesus has a command to evangelize. And this understanding that God is the one that draws people to the Son, who who saves us and gives us His Spirit, that understanding should unleash the most powerful boldness in us to get out there and talk about the one we love because He first loved us. The pressure is not on us to change hearts. Our job is to show up and witness and testify to the life, burial, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then we step back and watch what God will do. There might be a place and time for defending the truth, but our main call as believers is, is to point to the hope that we have in Jesus. Our main call is to pray for people more than we argue with them. Look at verse 17 again. Jesus said, Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. If you believe in Jesus, you are blessed. Walking, talking miracle. And I should add, this is for anyone who would believe. If you are searching for the truth, if you're searching for what this life is even supposed to be about, if you're weary and need rest... If you're wondering if the Father is drawing you, friend, He is. How do I know that? Because you're hearing these words right now. If you're here, it's because He's brought you to this place, and maybe it's time to get off the fence and meet Jesus. Perhaps this is the day that God would bring you out of darkness into His light, and I pray even now that your heart would be softened. Set aside everything that you said, well, I know, I know, I know that, and ask God what He would have to show you today. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to clean yourself up. Peter declared this revelation with, before fully understanding it. And I should just say, when you follow Jesus, life doesn't necessarily get easier. And I, I don't really know the best way to articulate this, but my best effort is that the current, the current suffering that you experience, the, the, the certain torments and, and maybe even just the boringness of life, It's not like all those things just suddenly change. But there's there's a strange shadow of beauty that falls on all of it that no human has ever been able to explain. Suffering, anxiety, depression, they don't suddenly disappear, but they do begin to appear less powerful. And over time may lose power altogether because one day he will wipe away every tear. And the monotony, the mundane, the ordinary takes on indescribable beauty as the rhythms of grace play out from the Spirit of God at work in our everyday lives. The drive to work is no longer the boring drive to work. You begin to notice the delightful creator. We're about to enter, like, the most beautiful season, and I'm sure that there's all kinds of scientific explanations for this, and I've said this before in sermons, but the leaves change colors, and I like to believe that it's just because God delights to have pretty colors for us to look at. 
You begin to see glimpses of glory. When you read passages like Romans 8.18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And your heart is warmed with comfort that no earthly vice could dream of matching. And so if you've not met Jesus, delay no longer. Come and talk to us. We'll pray with you. Meet the one who will change your life. Experience the love like you've never experienced. Okay, so perhaps you're here and you hear about Jesus and you hear about who he is and we're closing off this series. It's called The Dearest Place. It's from a Charles Spurgeon quote um, that I didn't have time to to read because it's long. (laughs) And you think, the dearest place? I've experienced anything but the dearest place when it comes to church. So, is the church a failure then? Has the truth of the gospel been lost because of the failure of God's supposed followers? Well, in short, no. And that brings us to our final point this morning, the great promise. So, for the sake of time and and for our series, we're going to spend most of our remaining time on verse 18. Um, I'm going to read all the way through verse 20, but verse 18 is where we're going to camp out. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. If you read that last verse on its own, it it might be confusing, but... with the context that we're going to add, it'll make more sense. Jesus was all about perfect timing, and it wasn't time yet. This is one of the most heavily debated pieces of Scripture. Uh, The Catholic Church interprets this to mean that Peter is the first pope. And and I've already said this. We don't, like, have time to unpack all of that, but in brief, we will deal with it because it is kind of a question, just what is the rock upon Jesus, you know, is going to build his church on? But... Briefly, I'll just say that Peter is not the rock. Uh, It really doesn't add up for him to be the rock. Um, People tend to kind of go that way because Peter means, you know, Petros means rock. Um, But like we said earlier, Peter didn't fully understand what he was saying. And we know most of these things didn't click for the apostles at all until after the resurrection. But more than just that, five verses later, Jesus calls him Satan, and I, I didn't take any, any quotes from Brian, uh, the, the pastor who provided this outline. I did keep this one quote, though, because it's, it's too good. He says, Peter goes from leader to Lucifer in five verses. <laughs> and so what is the rock? Well, we can see that it's the confession that Peter makes. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and we see that more from the following verses and the things that Jesus says and does than just the quirkiness. So we can like pick on Peter, even though, you know, most of us, we, we like to identify with people in the Bible, but we're, most of us are probably like the unnamed person in the background. Um, so rather than picking on Peter, we'll just look to Christ. Because after this passage, Jesus, go, Jesus goes on to explain how, how being this fulfiller of prophecy, being this Messiah, the, the Christ, what it actually means, and this is where what Peter didn't fully understand yet, What it actually means is that he's going to suffer and be killed. He's going to lay down his life. He's going to be the servant king. And that's where Peter says, no way. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And everything Jesus said was going to happen did. Jesus would go on performing miracles, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, raising the dead, all the while still not convincing the religious leaders. He would be falsely accused. Judas would betray him. Peter would deny him three times, deny even knowing him. Every single one of his followers would scatter and flee, and he nonetheless would remain faithful and steadfast, making his way to Calvary to be murdered. He was mocked, beaten beyond recognition, stripped of his clothes. They placed a crown of thorns on his head, nailed him to the tree, and the darkest day in the history of the universe ends with his body being laid in the tomb. But three days later, he gets up and he walks out. 
and he appears to many, and he ascends to the right hand, and he, just as he said he would do, he kept his promise. And so we rewind back to this moment in these verses. Jesus sees all that is ahead of him, and he, and he says, and he knows what they're about to go through, and he's lovingly preparing their hearts. He's saying, hey, listen, you're right, Peter. I'm building something that can't be stopped by death. And the world is going to try to cut the head off of this thing by killing me and killing you ultimately. But I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the defeater of death. What I build cannot and will not be destroyed. And I love, I love imagining what the disciples must have gone through emotionally. The night Jesus was crucified had to be the darkest moment. And all they had seen and learned and experienced coming to an end or so it would seem. You have to wonder if, like us, they wouldn't be wrestling internally or maybe even arguing with one another. Like, what was that thing he said about rising? Maybe they had, like, a glimmer of hope. Just try to put yourself in their shoes and then and hear this. Okay, Jesus ro- rose from the dead. He's walking with his disciples, and he's, he's unpacking the scriptures. He joins them for a meal, and we, we read this in Luke chapter 24. When he was at the table with them, He took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. He's alive! It's all true. It clicked for them. And here we are. Would you let that sink in? Oh, that our hearts would burn within us. Do you see the significance that it is that we walk through these doors every week? I can't stress it enough. Billy and I, we like Billy is the life of the party, but he we're not doing this because we want to hang out. We don't want just butts and seats. We are participating in something so cosmic and glorious that the gates of hell don't stand a chance. Remember our big idea, the church will not fail because Jesus made it. So what if the laws change? What if there's a huge moral shift in society? What if Christianity becomes hatred and viewed as harmful? I mean, look around, we are in that. And the church, the church that Jesus is building, will not fail. So what about us? Hebrews 10, 36, For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So let us, Coram Deo, soon to be Mission Church, let us not be those who shrink back. We need not fear governmental change. We don't need to stress over election cycles and what freedoms we might lose. Not that those things aren't important, but they, I mean, compared to this, maybe, maybe freedoms that for far too long we've taken for granted... We don't need to fear persecution. Rather, we should expect it because Jesus said it was going to happen. But even so, we don't need to fear death because Jesus made a promise and he keeps his promises. John Piper puts it like this. He gets in by dying. He gets out by resurrection. And now the gates are his. Revelation 1.18, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. The keys were kept on the inside. That's why he went in. And when he came out, he brought the keys with him. And now he will build his church. Death will take none and keep none that he finally wills to have. Jesus is going to build his church. And it's not going to fail. What about this church? Has the church failed? This, this question appeared on a, a Q&A poll on Instagram from an artist I follow, and his, his answer was so good I had to share it. This is what he wrote. No. <laughs> Could have left it at that. Uh, Jesus set it up, and not even the gates of hell will prevail. 
Be as committed to the church as Jesus in the way Jesus was committed to her, even the laying down of your life. Our culture wants to abandon what's broken, but Jesus is devoted to redeeming what's broken. You see, when I lived in Denver and I was young and naive and I was just like, well, we'll go here and do this, we'll go here and do that, my view was very inward focused. I thought about how I could be fulfilled, how I could find my spot. And that pastor that I met with, his loving rebuke, putting me in my place, flipped it on its head. How can I pour into others? God is doing incredible things in the life of our church, and and the church will not fail. Will we be a part of that? Because of this promise, the only way that we could fail is by losing the, the confession that we are commanded to hold fast to. And I, I specifically want to talk to some of the young people in the room. The time right now is primed and ready. You're going to be in the culture that is going to throw flashy words at you like deconstruction. And, 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 and they're going to paint Christianity like it's some hateful thing. And I would just say that, man, wrestle with your doubts. Wrestle with those things, but don't abandon the brokenness. When, when the culture around you says the church is broken, dig your heels in deeper because you're broken too. And let's do this together. Let's hold fast, everyone. Jesus made the church. It will not fail. So let's join in. I don't want to miss out on being a part of what God will do in Burke County, in Morganton. And I hope you don't want to miss out either. Four application questions, and then we'll pray. Number one, do I really know the Jesus of the Bible? Have you spent time in the Word? Have you, have you dug in deep? Have you spent time with Jesus? He's alive. He's present with us even now. Number two, who do I say Jesus is with my life, my words, my thoughts? Are you bearing fruit? Number three, how have I abandoned brokenness in the past? What would it take for me to be all in here? So what I mean by this is maybe church for you has has been sort of like, I mean, there's a phrase that exists for a reason, church shopping. Let's, Let's test the waters. Let's stick our feet in. Let's see how it feels. What if you just like took the floaties off and dove into the deep end? What if you fully gave yourself to the church? And, and if not Coram Deo slash Mission Church, any church, and said, I'm all in. Because when you leave a church, you're not leaving a building, you're leaving a people. What, what, what would it take for me to be all in here? And number four, what ways does God want me to serve the bride, his church, that I've delayed or ignored? Maybe there was a time in your younger years when you were a naive Bible college student. uh, Maybe there was a time in your younger years where God laid on your heart like wild ideas about being a missionary overseas or doing something insane like that that only God could call you to. But now you're grown up and now you've got a nine to five and churches for Sundays. What if you dug deeply into what God is still calling that it hasn't left? What ways are God, is God calling you to serve that you've delayed or ignored? Let's be committed. Let's, let's dive all in. Let's be a part of the church that's not going to fail. Let's pray together. Father, you know all things. And I thank you for the way that this week has played out. God, just so many different moments of uncertainty for me, of self-doubt. 
God, thank you for showing me my weakness. And maybe even putting it on display today so that your strength might be displayed. God, I ask that you would enable us to to worship you, Lord. I, I ask that you would soften our hearts. Father, God, I I ask that you would shake us from apathy, that we would be so moved by the truth of who you are, by by the gospel message, that it would be real to us, that no longer could we sit on the sidelines, no longer could we attend church, but God, that we would be the family that you died so that we could exist. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us first. In your name we pray.